You're listening to Creep Geeks Podcast. Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com forward slash cheapgeek. So it begins again. Welcome back to the Creep Geeks Podcast. This is episode number 126. Flying cryptids, UFOs, and the Creepy Carolinas. Yeah. So it begins again. Welcome back to the Creepy Geeks Podcast, episode number 126. If it's your very first time listening to the podcast, very much appreciate it, and we welcome you to the podcast. If today is your birthday, happy birthday, but either way, we're glad you're here. We're here. You're here. It's good. Okay? <laughs> Got a lot of stuff to talk about. So, what is this podcast all about? Well, broadcasting paranormal news and fun stories from our Creep Geeks Bunker Studio in the mountains of Western North Carolina. We're an offbeat news podcast that takes a lighthearted approach to the strange, the stupid, paranormal, and tech topics circulating the web. Yes, 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 indeed. So anyway, we're here today to talk to you about flying cryptids, UFOs, and creepy Carolinas. Yes. Today is our, I don't even know, 126th episode Yeah. of the podcast. That's crazy. <laughs> crazy talk. <laughs> So yes, podcast is growing, and it's because of listeners like you that that is the case, and we very much appreciate your support every time you listen to us. It's a good thing. It makes makes it good. makes it nice, <laughs> and we appreciate it. Having a really hard time trying to be a nice guy, right? I'm like, yeah, let me try to be nice. It's not working. Anyway, we got a lot of stuff to talk about, right? Mm-hmm. Okay, so the podcast that we do every Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, whenever it winds up happening, is available for you for download in all sorts of different places, like iHeartRadio, iTunes, or Apple Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Google, Google, Google Play Music, you know, SoundCloud, Spotify, yeah, Radio.com, almost uh, all major platforms. Yes, for podcasting. Basically, pretty much anywhere you can listen to the podcast, you can listen to us. And if you have an opportunity and you're listening and you like what you hear, don't be scared to rate. A little rating won't hurt anybody. <laughs> As a matter of fact, it's a good thing. It actually helps us grow. Ratings increase a podcast visibility, which helps it reach a larger audience. Yes. So. And if you uh, would like to support the podcast, there's a couple different ways you can do that. But the easy way, aside from doing a rating, is uh, through little to no effort on your part, right? You can support us, and it's really easy. It won't cost you anything at all. And pretty much it works just like this. When you go to Amazon.com and shop and buy stuff, which we all do, if you use our affiliate link, we'll get a small percentage. Doesn't change your price at all, and it helps us to keep the coffee flowing and gas in the albino rhino. Yeah. Our DIY camper van yes. slash equipment van slash investigation van. Our very <laughs> own mystery machine, if you will. Yes. Except for we don't have a great dame named Scooby. We have a small Salty. chihuahua <laughs> named Pepper. Yes. Yes. Salty little dog. Yes. So with the podcast, we do like uh, participation. And if you'd like to participate, if you have something you'd like to share, something you want to talk about, you can always give us a call and leave us a message because we have a phone number set aside just for that particular purpose right there. And that phone number is? 575-208-4025. That's right. And we also have a Facebook group that you can participate in. What's the name of the Facebook group? Creep Geeks Facebook group. Yes. <laughs> <clears throat> it's uh, you know, a lot of thought went into that name. <laughs> Yeah. But it's it's a good group. People like to contribute, and there's funny stuff and all sorts of weird stories and things like that. And we actually get show suggestions from there. Yeah, sometimes. Yeah. But sometimes they're just kind of lame, but that's okay. Hey. I'm just saying. <laughs> it's, it's all right. It is a very active group. We do <clears throat> interact with people all the time on there. And unlike some groups, it's well moderated. We do want to give a little thank you to our moderators. Yeah, since they're all like, well, how come we didn't get welcomed to the group? <laughs> it's because like, you're, you're one of the founding members. Yeah, anyway. <laughs> A little bit of whinage on their part, but it's okay. We it's appreciate really them. 
Yes. Point. So. Yeah. And we appreciate one of them more than the other. Hey. And we're not going to say who it is, but then duke it out little fisticuffs. If you, but but no, it's a good time. It's a, it's a great place to network with a show, get to know us, get to know them. And hey, share your thoughts. We also have a Facebook page. That's where we put announcements as well as updates for when the podcast comes out. And you can find us all over social media. Yeah. So. <laughs> Well, I thought you were going to keep going. You're on a roll. <laughs> well, no. I mean, we are on Twitter and we are on Instagram. Our yes. Instagram's fairly lively. We post a bunch, a lot of stuff that we're either investigating, current adventures, or topics that we plan to talk about. Yeah, we do take a lot of pictures and we do um, a lot of video and things like that. So it kind of works out. You yeah. can go check some things out. And our Instagram is uh, Creep Geeks Pod. Yep. If you want to kind of look at that and see, also with Twitter. And speaking of video, we do have a YouTube. And all links to everything we're talking about will be in the show notes for this podcast episode. So you can get to our YouTube channel from this, the show notes for this episode. Yep. And yeah. you can also find us at creepgeeks.com. We can also find the podcast and the show notes listed there as well, along with a little handy form that you can click. And fill out whatever experience or whatever it is that you want to share and fill it out and send it right to us. So. Okay. We have lots of different ways to communicate. It's very nice. <laughs> very, very nice. And uh, we typically when we do the podcast, we'd like to start out with an interesting random factoid. And this time the random factoid is, is you know, usually we do the random factoids just to kind of unusual things. but And break it down. But yeah. Let's this, just... this is more of a. Observation. Uh, observation from an article that came from the telegraph.co.uk about the smartphone debunking Nessie, otherwise known as the Loch Ness Monster. Which I don't I don't agree with. Um, you had said earlier when we were talking about this that the primary point of this is since smartphones, everybody has one, there should be more evidence of the Loch Ness Monster. Yes. But there isn't. Therefore, the Loch Ness Monster is debunked. Yes. And there's just so many... That's such a loose argument. Yes. Uh, primarily the fact that it's a smartphone and it's a water cryptid. Most people don't use their smartphones around the water. There's only a couple of models that I think are waterproof. Yes. And Bigfoot, since smartphones do put a good or decent camera in everybody's hand there's more bigfoot evidence and there's a lot more ufo <clears throat> evidence now because of smartphones yeah and this is this article was written by a paleontologist named um uh dr darren nice mm -hmm. i think well, actually he's a paleontologist that talks to um uh, henry boykin actually is the writer of this article but okay. what they say basically is, is that, like you were saying, that since everybody has good phones, you would really think that there'd be more better photos out there, more and better photos out there. And the only things that have come across have been terribly low resolution little blobs in the distance. Right? Mm-hmm. And it's like, okay, well, I understand where they're coming from. And, the, you know, blob squatch is kind of the nickname for when you have like a, you know, possible something like a cryptid sighting or something like that. And the picture is just so resolution looks like a, you know, a blurry potato, right? <laughs> But see, just to kind of the, I understand where they're coming from, but I don't necessarily agree when they say that <clears throat> since we have more cell phones out there, we should have more pictures. That's not and, necessarily true. Yeah. And, but they also say that since there, since there, there are more cell phones out there, we don't have as many pictures and the amount of pictures that we have or amount of evidence that we have, even video is actually less yeah. than before cell phones. That's garbage. But it's like they haven't factored in <clears throat> different things like YouTube. Yeah. For example, I mean, if you're ever bored, go ahead and just go to YouTube and type in Bigfoot and sit back. Or a water cryptid. Or anything like that. Yeah. I mean, there's like everything from documentaries to, to old shows from television to, you know, all sorts of things like sightings like Bigfoot caught on tape, all sorts of crazy stuff, right? But they don't factor that in. They just typically talk about the phones. Yeah. And there's also the fact that most people with their cell phones these days, especially when they're out there actively using them, aren't really using them for taking pictures necessarily. And we, Most of the time you're face deep in your phone, yeah. just trudging along, not paying attention to anything at all. So I would think that, you know, <clears throat> just because we have a phone doesn't necessarily mean we're using it for pictures. Yeah. So. And we've, we've come across instances where we know people who are trying to take pictures 
and they don't know how to take pictures with their phone. Absolutely. As a matter of fact, this kind of happened to us the other day. We went somewhere nice. It was uh, underground. It was a cave, a cavern. So kind of dark. Tour. Yeah. And at the very end of it, a very nice couple said, hey, we, we can take your picture. And we were like, well, that's great. And guess what? What? Two blob squatches is what we're going to turn it into. <laughs> so they tried. And we have to give them that. So. Yeah. And they were very nice to offer. Yes. And <clears throat> what's funny is um, because they offered, we also offered, Greg offered to take their picture. And yes. Greg held their phone, tapped the screen to focus, made sure that the phone was pointed in a way that there's enough light, and got an amazing picture of yeah. them. Three of them, because that's what you do. You know, yeah. hashtag photographer. Yeah. Their hashtag was, thanks for trying. <laughs> But, I mean, you know, just because there's more phones out there doesn't necessarily mean that the picture is going to be better. Now, I would like that if somebody seen something, that they would ha- be able to take like that half a second to bring the camera up, tap to focus, and, and shoot a couple of pictures. That'd be super great. But, yeah, you know, it's probably not going to happen. You know, we go out with the intention of taking pictures, so we're kind of at the ready. Sure. Most people don't do that. And yeah. then also, like, you were, you were talking about the blob squatch thing, and that reminded me of some video footage that came out in like February or something where people had a smartphone and they were shooting from across a ski resort all the way up a mountain trying to see something crawling yeah. around. I mean, you, you do the best you can with the camera you have, but sometimes yeah. it's just not going to come. And then like I could say the same for Loch Ness because Loch Ness is a pretty big lock. Yeah. You know? So it, the argument is flimsy. And that's pretty much our our. <clears throat> Interesting yes. random factoid is your argument is flawed. Yeah, your argument is moot. <laughs> and basically what it boils down to is this article says that since the cell phones are out there and there hasn't really been that much new evidence or um, a larger increase in evidence that it just proves that Loch Ness Monster is a, is a myth. No. Yeah, so I don't know. And see, when I first clicked on this a long time ago when I was reading this, you know, it said, you know, the clickbait title is what actually got me. Smartphones have killed the Loch Ness Monster. And I'm thinking, and I'm, yeah, same thing. Like yeah. maybe Wi-Fi or something. <laughs> no, nope, they're just saying it. It doesn't exist because there's not more pictures of it. Hmm. Which is the same thing that people said when people were using film and other cameras just to take pictures. They're like, oh, it doesn't exist because otherwise we'd have more pictures of it. Yeah. Mm. So this particular article from the Telegraph Co. UK: Smartphones have killed the Loch Ness monster. Zoologist tells Festival. <laughs> Garbage. <laughs> so there you go. Garbage. <clears throat> but I understand their point, you know, and they also talk about it. And it's one of the things that kind of got me was like uh, the University of Southampton expert on cryptozoology, the pseudoscience of mythical creatures. You know, it's like, oh, it's going to go like that already. <laughs> okay. You already thrown a glove. So. Yeah. <laughs> It's like the pseudoscience. I mean, sure, it may be a pseudoscience. They didn't have to do it all like that. They didn't have to do your boy like that. Yeah. Dome, yeah. dome darty. Yeah. So, yeah. Like, all right. And, you know, Dr. Naish, or whatever his name is, I don't know how to pronounce it exactly, a paleontologist, everybody has good phones, you would really think. It's like, okay, man, you're a paleontologist, not a photographer. <laughs> so, I wasn't going to go there. I but. am. <laughs> yeah, it's like terribly low resolution little blobs in the distance. It's like. You know, hey, we all have our specialties. Not everybody is professional, so it is what it is. So there you go. You're a paleontologist. I'm a photographer. I can take a great picture in the dark. <laughs> so give me a spoon. I can probably dig up a bone or two. But aside from that, I don't really know. But yeah. Okay. Yeah, take that. <laughs> salty. Well, yeah, I'm a little salty because it sort of, you know, kind of kicks it out there and just makes these assumptions. And, you know, the article does lay out a timeline of like, about when, like, say, for example, Yeti was first sighted, like in 326 BC from Alexander the Great. And they kind of keep going, you know. Yeah. And then they talk about his sales of camera equipped, you know, phones have soared. There have been droughts of several years with no new Nessie pictures. And those that have emerged have been unconvincing. Yeah, but he's it's taking. Like, you know, you could have the best camera in the world. If the thing ain't there to show up, it ain't there. And just because you don't see it doesn't mean it exists. You know, I, I go back to the uh, coelacanth, right? Yeah. It said that thing was ex- basically extinct for a million years or more. Yeah. And they go to research it, and they go to the place where it's been seen. And uh, a couple of scientists were talking about it, the researchers. And the locals that were there were like, oh, you want one? You want to see it? And yeah. They just, like, took them over and showed them one. Like, yeah, we catch them all the time. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, and they're like, and this was, you know, the fish that walked on land and all this crazy stuff. But no, was there like a little Bob <clears throat> Seal Camp fish stand or something? <laughs> oh, that's like the fishermen were like, yeah, we throw that thing back, right? Oh, okay. So, oh, yeah, here you go. You want, you want to see one? So, I don't know. But you now, on the other side of that, though, as far as an essay being a real thing, as in like a giant uh, plesiosaur, yeah. I don't know. I, there's not enough food in Loch Ness to support something that big, so I don't know. I know. I just really, so. really want a water cryptid. Yeah. Well, get the old sea that you can't. How about that? But it's not as cute. What? <laughs> I don't know. I, I think a giant fleshy ple- plesiosaur is probably not that It's cute. not fleshy. It is too fleshy. No, it's, it's got to be like... feathers. A, Might have feathers. No. But, you know. It's, it's got to be like kind of like an alligator-ish, maybe, or some sort of like... Hide <clears throat> like a reptile, like reptilian hide, yeah, like a cold blooded reptile, yeah, yeah, that's what it is. And it's fleshy, don't <laughs> <laughs> gross, gross, oh, fleshy. So, stop. anyway, moving along in the old podcast, there after we got done talking about the uh, our interesting random factoid, which is that cell phone killed Nessie, mm-hmm. which I don't agree with. We're going to move on into a couple other different things here, mainly some flying cryptid type action. But before we do, we're going to talk about a UFO, okay. Not just any UFO. The UFO that crashed in Gig Harbor, Washington. Okay. Yeah. Allegedly, a UFO crashed in Gig Harbor, Washington, and was and basically was recovered or salvaged by the U.S. Navy. Hmm. That's kind of how the story goes. And it was in the newspaper. It was like it was in the news. So it was reported that a UFO crashed in the harbor. Okay. So whatever that is, I don't know as far as like what the, the newspaper is. But um, this article that I read was from a uh, sort of an eyewitness account from somebody who was supposed to be there. Okay. It was in 1982. <clears throat> it says, um, this guy's a Coast Guard guy, right? Mm-hmm. In 1982, I was stationed on the U.S. Coast Guard Cutter Point Glass in Gig Harbor in the state of Washington, and I'd heard on the news that a UFO had crashed into the bay off of the harbor, which would be Gig Harbor. Yeah. And it says, the next morning I was reported in for duty and was informed that we were getting underway. That's when the ship basically... You know, takes lines off and goes to sea or, or goes. They leaves port, right? Yeah. And that the Navy had installed a device on board and that the crew, with the exception of the Master Chief and the XO, or Executive Officer, usually second in command, uh, were to stay below decks until other arise. Uh, in other words, they were ordered to stay below, pretty much. Like, don't go out. That's kind of weird. But anyway. Yeah. So they launched, they got underway, and they went to their area of search. And when they arrived, right, yeah, they crossed the area, and every dust bunny and cigarette pack wrapper crawled up the bulkheads when they passed through the area, and then it would slide down after they left the area. Huh. So they got to a certain point where static, I guess, electricity was so great that it was basically static, I don't know, you know, basically making the static charge of, like, dust. Dust bunnies are like little dust balls, you know, like lint and stuff like that. Yeah. Charged up, and they would stick, you know, to the walls, right? And mm-hmm. then when it passed through, it would fall down. Kind of weird, huh? That is weird, because that <clears throat> so. means, like, the static, anything with any sort of <clears throat> excuse me momentum with static. You know, dust bunnies, because they're actually held together with static. And those little cellophane yeah. wrappers, I mean, their whole movement and how they float around or just whatever. Yeah. It's all static. And they said it did it, like, several times. So this guy was like, it did several times as they went passing back and forth across that area. And then he said, it was my understanding that the Navy came to the spot, recovered what was there, and they're still in the dark as to what was located. Hmm. So, hmm. Yeah. And, I mean. But the detail of the static, I thought, was pretty interesting. That's kind of why I put that in there. I want to know what the Navy put on there, on this Coast Guard boat. Probably, I don't know. Something probably to record. Which is funny, because if you you look and you start looking at, like, uh, National UFO Reporting Center and things like that. There was a Mari Island incident, and it actually makes me think we should do a whole podcast about UFOs in Washington. Okie dokie. Yeah. It, it's really, <clears throat> you think Washington, you think Bigfoot, kind of. Yeah. You know, Washington, Oregon, Bigfoot. No, there's a lot of UFOs out there. <laughs> yes. So, yeah, we should visit that. So. Okie dokie. Mm-hmm. And we're not going to do that. Not tonight. We don't have time. I, I know. In but the future. In the future. But it, it's definitely in something you should 2000. mention. Because, I mean, with UFOs trending right now in the news, or at least all over Twitter. Yeah, but I mean, why? Why You could have to look at that. Why, and, and that's something we're going to talk about, too. Why are the UFOs trending in the news? You'll find out in a little bit. 
<laughs> dun, dun, dun. Really? Yeah. Well, no, I mean, it's something that kind of makes sense, and it kind of ties into something we're going to talk about. But, yeah, uh, you know, UFO sightings have been around forever. Mm-hmm. Not just like recently, but it just seems like when certain things happen in today's day and age, and it brings the attention to the forefront, people seem to act like it has been happening for a long time. Okay. It's just kind of a thing, right? Yeah. And it's always like, oh, here we go. We're going to get disclosure any minute now, and it doesn't happen. They've been saying that since like the 50s. They're mm-hmm. going to tell us. They're going to tell us all about the UFOs. And then when there aren't any, or there is no disclosure, what do they say? Yes, they know. They just don't <laughs> want to tell us. It's like, all right, well. That's what they, or <clears throat> something comes out, and it's, well, yeah. that's what they want you to know. That's what we want you to say. It's yeah. Like, of course they would say that. It's like, oh, come on, man. And my big argument with the whole disclosure thing is, again, I, like I, I keep comparing to other things such as the JFK assassination. Yeah. You know, I mean, we were supposed to have all of the documents released within the past few years. And we still have. There's still a bunch. A bunch that have not been released. Yeah. So if that's a, an event everybody is aware of and we still can't get full disclosure on that, how are we going to get full disclosure on something that is contested well we're not yeah so i mean who knows right (laughs) but yeah i mean who knows what's actually going to take for them to really like if there is anything to disclose to really disclose something but that's that whole and then even then you know say there was ufos just landing in your backyard they'd say well we didn't know anything about it but how would you know you know so who knows i think that there's something going on what it is exactly, I don't know. It's too late to speculate. <laughs> so, <clears throat> but I don't know. I don't know about that. I think there's plenty of room to speculate. I tell you what, there's plenty of pollen around here. This stuff is killing my throat. Yeah. So, so and you, it's raining. Do you need a no? Okay. I don't need your crinkly water. <laughs> it's like that's like the loudest thing in the world. Two two of the loudest things in the world or in the world potato chip bag at three o'clock in the morning when you're trying to sneak a chip in those little water bottles and your computer chair yeah and <laughs> yeah and this stupid computer <laughs> chair i actually have bought in the past six months three freaking chairs and they all suck hmm. so i guess i'm gonna have to crack my wallet further than the 36 dollars i like to spend on it <laughs> maybe get something a little bit better i'm gonna um, make your your computer chair a twitter account <laughs> yeah where it's like or just creaks <laughs> it's like oh what is that hey they do those uh, asmr videos that'll be mine right? oh no just a creaky computer chair in your ear has its own channel yeah. so you can have like soap cutting and computer chair racket right <laughs> so it's gross yeah so anyway this whole ufo drama yeah what's it about you know what? Nobody really knows. It started off with another UFO special being on, you know, cable television. On the televisions. And there were some very strong opinions. And that just, and I didn't even get to see all of that. Yes. And then it turned into a big old. I don't think I've seen it at all. Yeah, we yeah we haven't. Because the show in question, I mean, I think it aired at like, you know, old people time yeah. o'clock. It, it aired at all uh, <laughs> but 30 in the afternoon. <laughs> you know? But it, it just caused so much drama, and everybody took the drama to Twitter. Well, and it's funny, too, because this has happened a lot, this and kind of thing, where people get all fired up. It's been happening so. for a couple months, but I guess this was kind of the the tipping point. Yeah. And we're not going to delve into it too far, because we're not going to take sides. What we are going to say is it is primarily old school versus new school, and several of us are either sitting back and eating popcorn or poking fun at both sides. Yeah. And and that's the thing. You have to pay respects to both parties. And that's that's where I, I have a problem. Because mm. why does everybody, whether it's new school researchers, like all the young kids on the block, or the old school people who, you know, have done their time in the UFO community. Yeah. Everybody expects a bended knee to use Game of Thrones there, you know? Hmm. Are you going to bend the knee to me? I, I've i done all this work. You know, and that's usually yeah. the old school opinion. The new school is, I've found new ways to do research and uncover or search for the truth. You know, and the funny thing is, at the end of the day, there's nothing <clears throat> that says that one way is better than the other. You yeah. Know? 
And if you have newer means to do research, great. But you can't disrespect somebody who's put the hard effort in. It's almost like, you know, back in my day, yeah, we cut the grass with scissors. <laughs> you know, and you're like, well, okay, well, I'm using a lawnmower. It's way better. Well, whatever, man. Yeah. But realistically, re- regardless of what side you're on and whether who's right or wrong or whatever, this UFO phenomenon, uh, I mean, you can't say who's right or who's wrong, you know? And then, like, we because, have... I mean, if we could say who is right or who's wrong, then we would have things like, you know, there are aliens out there. Disclosure has happened. You know, all that stuff. The truth is is what it is. And that's and where it started is, to get dirty, though. Because yeah. that's where it started to get dirty because, like, we've linked to an article by <clears throat> John E.L. Tenney. Yeah. Great editorial there. And he mentioned something about one of the sides started to throw the whole disinformation accusation out. Like one side is putting out false information to the other? No, like one is saying, like, new school's all disinformation. Hmm. Yeah. So that's that's where we stand right now is, you know, people don't like how the information's being relayed to the general public and there's mudslinging. You know, at the end of the day, everybody just needs to come together and stop being stupid. And that's a thing. Work together as a team. Share the information, compare one side of information to the other side, and if they're the same, right, then why not, like, use that as a starting point for something else to reel in some of these weird sort of, you know, outliers when it comes to the whole UFO thing, whether they're, like, temporal travelers or phase dimensional beings, yeah. or if they travel through hyper-dimensional thought-controlled ships of light. And come together. Who the hell and- knows? Nobody knows all this yes. stuff, and whether they say they do or not at the end of the day, you won't be able to prove it. It's just like when they say, "Oh, I'm gonna, I'm on, been talking about UFOs on talk shows, and now there's like cars following me, strange people looking at me. You know, there's white vans everywhere. The men in black. My thing is though, the rude men in black. That's one that's pretty. Funny. Why can't people come together and collaborate in a respectful manner well, instead of slinging mud? Like, well, and a good example. I think example, it starts that way, but at the end of the day, I think it becomes this, this sort of like, you know, like you were saying, you didn't respect the way I did it, so why do I need to respect the way you did it? The bend the knee so, attitude. And my well, thing is, yeah. Come together, collaborate. We've seen some really good collaboration recently, and one of those examples is Skinwalker Ranch. Yeah. That was new school and old school coming together to tell the story of Skinwalker Ranch. Yeah. That's a great little documentary thing. Yeah, it, on. Was, it was okay. I mean, I it was mean, pretty yeah. good. I would rather just George Knapp did all the talking personally, but that's just me. But that's because we're both in love with George Knapp. We're so. not in love. <laughs> okay, first off, you speak for yourself. I'm not in love with George Knapp. <laughs> So don't put me in that category. <laughs> You're a big fan. Well, I am a big so. fan. I'm not in love with him. <laughs> oh, I'm in love with Jordan. No, not in love with okay. Ross Mitchell either. So, yeah, dare you. But the article we mentioned is actually titled "Can't We All Just Take a Ride?" and it does harken back to Ross Mitchell introducing Art Bell. Yeah. So, but. Like we said, we we do not want to take sides. We're gonna sit back. We're gonna watch the pop, <clears throat> yeah. watch watch the drama unfold. Eat popcorn, and keep reporting. That's it. Okay. Well, I mean, <laughs> when it comes down to it, we're gonna keep doing what we do. Yeah. And talk about and UFOs. everybody's wrong. Hey. <laughs> if they go into it like that, dude, you're wrong. And the other person's like, dude, you're wrong. And everybody's wrong. And they can work together to become right. Oh. Yeah. Speaking of giant bird shadows. Great transition. Well, hey. <laughs> you know, it's all this UFO drama is silly. Just like all the cryptid drama is silly. Yeah. You know, and the whole thing is silly. Like, oh, you're a UFO guy. You, you, you're not supposed to like cryptids. Well, what did you? Oh, you can't speak about cryptids because you're a UFO guy. Oh, well, you're somebody who believes in witchcraft. And you can't talk to somebody who hunts with things in the woods because I don't believe. You're all stupid. Everybody's stupid. And why don't we all just get together in the stupidness and figure out how to become better? What did we say on our very first episode? You can like it all. Yeah, because we do. And, I, you know, I'm not one to say one thing is right over there. I, I'm interested in all of it. Yeah. But at the end of the day, you know, don't don't come at me all wrong, bro. Yeah. Because I'll suck you in the nose. Don't <laughs> you stop? <laughs> Go all old school. Don't be grumpy. <laughs> I bust out some of that old school jargon on you. And give you the red ass. No, what we said so I thought that was actually on our very fun. first episode, which was you, just like 
our listeners, you can like it all. You can research yeah. it all. You can delve into it. You can discuss it all. Yeah. And you can be wrong. It's okay yeah. to be wrong. And because maybe something that you're thinking about what is being one way is, is doesn't match anymore. It doesn't work anymore. Yeah. It'd be good to have an open thought about it. But I'll still suck you in the nose if you kept me come at me all <laughs> sideways, right? I'd like Stop. to see that. Have like a battle royale. All the old crusty people and all the young crusty people out there. Because, you know, the old people probably served in some wars and stuff, so they're probably all mean. <laughs> right? Young people, all their hair product and junk come busting up on them. It'd be all like, what was that show that used to be on MTV a long time ago? Like Celebrity Deathmatch. <laughs> so, yeah. Wouldn't it be funny? In the cryptid and like paranormal 14 world. Yeah. Just like start pitting, each other. pitting experts against each other. Yeah. That would be funny. Oh, man. No, that'd be awful. <laughs> It'd be some <laughs> all the terrible hair involved. <laughs> so, anyway, so let's talk about something I seen that I thought was relatively interesting about mm-hmm. giant bird shadows. <clears throat> okay. So, um, when people are a little kid, right? Mm hmm. And. They're out there doing their thing, and they see giant bird shadows. What do they think? Monster. Giant yeah. bird. Okay. Well, do you think monster? <laughs> I don't know. It's a giant bird shadow. <laughs> but see, okay, so the way this article goes is, is this person says they were a little kid, they remember seeing shadows of what appeared to be giant birds flying over their neighborhood. Mm-hmm. And, you know, they do see hawks and eagles and things like that. But uh, so they're out doing some uh, yard work, getting the mail, and they'll see the shadow coming down the street. Right, and they look up and they don't see what's actually casting that shadow. Shadow is always dark; it's not too high. They just never seem to see it. Okay, right. And there's been a lot of reports like that where people have reported these giant shadows and not seeing what's actually casting the shadow. And since I like the Thunderbird and all that good stuff, I was thinking to myself, well, isn't that, wouldn't that be something that where maybe these these things fly at such a way or at a certain distance, or they're smart enough to keep the sun on one side of them so that if you looked up, you wouldn't be able to see them. Yeah. Maybe that's part of it. Maybe they're actually intelligent hmm. enough to, um, you know. But it's also a part of the, the mythos. fly sort of being camouflaged. It's also a part of the mythos, especially in, like, the Navajo and the, the indigenous traditions. It, the, the Thunderbird's shadow comes up, and that's what brings in whatever's coming in. So Maybe. Yeah, and it rides on the... On the Wings are clouds of the storm. So they're called storm clouds. Yes, storm clouds. It rides on the storm clouds on the wings of the clouds. I don't you know what? So that <laughs> reminds me of that Puerto Rican uh cruise that that guy was on. Well they went to a cruise, they went to like Puerto Rico. Yeah. And he seen you know on the top of the storms these two huge birds flying around and he was like, And I know what I saw and he was all angry about it. <laughs> yeah. It's a real specific list detail. We talked about that what, so, like a month ago? Yeah. Something yeah. Like that. But, you know, so this person talks about seeing these, these large shadows fly over, and they look, and they don't see anything. And then they also mention their mother. It says that uh, my mother has seen the bird shadows, and she says that they're thunderbirds. And lots of times, just before the shadow appears, all the birds get quiet, and the rabbits and other animals freeze. So, hmm. And so they said that they had one go right over them when they looked up. They didn't see anything but darkness for a second. And, and they know that, you know, they think it wasn't a plane. There was no engine noise. It wasn't a kite or anything like that. Yeah. And they see regular shadows or shadows of like regular animals like hawks. And they look up and, you know, they can see them. Mm-hmm. So why can't they ever see this big giant bird shadow when it's like 20 times the size of a regular hawk? See, I, I, Maybe there's something to that. That's, yeah. that's all. Kind of put that in there and go, well, that kind of makes sense, you know. And then in the comments, somebody re- referenced <laughs> that, you know, they grew up in southern Indiana. And their grandmother used to see something large occasionally fly over. And she said it was huge. Cast a very large shadow. Yeah. Yeah. Now, is Indiana... But she said it looked like a p- p- pterodactyl. Oh. Now, is Indiana mostly like plains or flatland? I have no idea. Oh, okay. I was just wondering if that would cause it to cast a bigger shadow. So. I don't think it would really matter because shadows come from on high, right? Yeah. I don't know. If, you, if you're from Indiana and you know anything about shadows or plains or something, well, let us know. Yeah, I only bring that up because of the whole, like, I had a glider person gliding on the Sandia Mountains while I was hiking, and yeah. the way his shadow cast as he dipped in between the little mountain peaks, it cast very large, but it cast at an angle. Like, I, tr- uh, it took him, like, two or three passes before I went, oh, that's that's one of those paraglider people. Hmm. Yeah, and um, the angle in which I actually saw him was different than how his shadow cast against the mountain. Hmm. So... Yeah. I don't know. Hmm. 
kind of weird. Yeah, but that kind of brings up the next thing, which was a these girls who were attacked by a huge blackbird, and that's in San Jose, California. And this kind of ties into something, a Lawndale, Illinois bird attack incident, including a large bird. Yes. Yes. <laughs> uh, basically, uh, these young girls, it was... Um, a girl and her friend named Ida in 1969 or 1970 in San Jose, they were walking across the street in front of the, their house when a huge black bird um, came swooping down the hill at the end of the street and then straight at them and tried to grab them. She remembers it shrieking when it missed them, and she remembers the whole street getting dark as it flew over. She also had bad dreams about it afterwards and telling her parents about the bad dreams. They didn't believe her. They told her to quit making up stories. And she's always remembered it very vividly. It scared the holy poop out of her. Yes. So, yeah. And this was actually sent in to Phantoms and Monsters in response to the Lawndale, Illinois bird attack. So, um, oh, no. My link isn't working. <laughs> Yes. So, so yeah. <clears throat> with the Lawndale and the Lays incident, there were two people that were attacked mm. by giant birds. Oh. Yeah. So this person says that they seen two Thunderbirds in Springfield, Illinois. Yeah. Right? And they referenced the day before Marlon Lowe was attacked in Lawndale, Illinois. Okay. And so this person was a witness. In other words, they had seen the birds that allegedly attacked this kid named Marlon. Hmm. And this kid, Marlon, um, you know, <laughs> you got a little bit of a rough go after all this, but what had happened was the bird, this big giant bird flew down and grabbed old Marlon and kind of went to fly off with him. And then he got, you know, basically let free. The bird let him go because his mom was screaming at him, right? Yeah. And this is along the fields, the uh, open fields near Kickapoo Creek. Yeah. And... Two giant birds passed over. One of them suddenly swooped down to grab the boy, carried him a few feet before dropping him because the mom was screaming. You know, of course, I guess it scared the bird. Yeah. And then both birds flew away. And this and was... The incident occurred in front of seven witnesses. Yeah. They all said the same thing. They didn't want to pick in the newspaper. It made the news, right? Yeah. And they said, you know, when they described the bird, it had a white ring around its neck. It was about half a foot long. The rest of the body was very black. The bird's bill was about six inches long and hooked at the end. Had claws on the feet that were arranged like three in the front and uh, one in the back. And each wing was about four feet at the very least. So the entire length of the body and the bird and everything, uh, the body from, it was about four feet. So it's a pretty big bird. And Marlin weighed about 50 pounds, right? Yeah. Because in the same article, they also mentioned this kid named George Reese, who was also sort of swooped down because he was playing with like four kids outside on the hillside. And, and they say an eagle swooped down and fastened his talons into the back, uh, well, into the slack of George's overalls and then <laughs> fly off with him, right? Yeah. And the shouts of the friends, uh, his buddies, little play friends, caused the eagle to drop him. Hmm. And the boy was rendered unconscious. But, you know, he, he said he, but he rallied after about 30 minutes, right? Yeah. And so uh, they said the eagle had a wingspan of about 10 feet, but this bird would have a wingspan also of about 10 feet. And both these boys were 50 to 56 pounds. Yeah. Which is interesting. And we were saying originally, you know, Marlon kind of had a rough go afterward. And that's true. These incidents made national news. Marlon ended up being ridiculed at school and dubbed the bird boy. Yeah. His mom, unfortunately, would find dead birds on her porch, you know, as the work of pranksters. Um, one of the witnesses, I guess, his name was Jake. At work, he'd hear, hey, Jake, fly over here and fix this. Yeah. Uh, They're kind of poking at him. Yeah. Um, this one person, Mr. Cox, once hearing of the jokes, jabs, and taunts, reluctantly told his story, but then insisted his actual identity never be revealed. Um, it turns out Ruth and Jake ended up enlisting a couple of local men to hunt Kickapoo Creek in the hopes of finding and destroying these big birds. Ruth threw the county game warden out of her house after the warden allegedly laughed in her face and called her a liar. And this is in the 70s. Yeah. So. I mean, that. It's, you know, it's. Uh, we're not talking like the 30s or 20s where it's like. Yeah, but you I mean, know, you know, really. It, you wouldn't do that now because yeah. all they have to do is pick up a phone and call and complain. But 
Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and, and it's one of those things where it's kind of a bone of contention because uh, even the Discovery Channel uh, had a show called Into the Unknown, and they gave you know some mention to you know the story of the kids being picked up by these birds, but then they they came across and dismissed it fairly quickly as saying it was a vulture. And it's like, okay, I, I don't know of any vulture that can pick up a 56-pound red-haired kid. Yeah, and both these birds are uh, kind of described more like a raptor, you know? Yeah. Like a hawk-type thing, you know? Yeah, like a hunter. Yeah. Not like a scavenger. Yeah. So, I don't know. It's kind of crazy because we do follow Thunderbird sightings and large bird sightings and even the uh, rock-style Thunderbird, which is more of a p- pterodactyl, <laughs> you know? <laughs> So it was kind of like, okay, so those, those are a couple of instances of, of flying cryptids that swoop down and grab some kids. And it was funny because there was a video on the internet a while ago on YouTube and Facebook and everywhere else where a big giant bird swoops down and grabs a, an, an, like a toddler. Oh, right? yeah. Yeah, by the coveralls and flies off with them and then eventually kind of drops the kid, you know. Isn't and people there... are like, oh, that's fake, that's fake. <clears throat> and it looked like an eagle, but it's kind of like, you know, did this – did whoever create that video read that story about the kid who got, you know, sort of picked up by the bird there? Yeah. You know, whether it be Marlin or the other little, uh, uh, what's his name? The other little kid? George. George. Yeah. George Meese. Why do I remember seeing one where it ended up, it was almost like a bunch of people hopped in a truck and it was obvious they were like on the res and they were going to go hunt it. I, I don't know. That's not what I'm talking about though. This is yeah. like at a city park. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so... But, you know, there's lots of reports of Thunderbirds and flying cryptids around. Yeah. And it seems like, a, depending on where you are, and we actually talked about this, 2017, 2018 had a lot of sightings of these big birds. These, these, and also the other cryptids that were out there. Yeah. Uh, like your Mothman style or, or the Owlman yeah, wonder- sort of look to it. That uh, That's in uh, more of England, though, but yeah, kind of crazy, right? But I- see, you know, it wasn't just those two boys that were attacked. There were some girls. Oh, yeah, you know, those are the ones that you're talking about. In, I believe San Jose, right? Yeah. Yeah, they were attacked, or they, you know, we can't really say attacked as in they got them, but an attack was made. Attempt. An attempt. Yeah. Yeah, attempted, alleged, attempted, attempted, alleged. Yeah. So. No. And then with all that, you know, large, winged, cryptid type stuff, it made me curious because I'm like, okay, all these winged cryptid sightings, we do, we we are really interested in Thunderbirds. Has any of that ever happened here in North Carolina? Yes. And I i mean, North Carolina, it's a variety of different environments. We've got anything from coastal beaches to a little bit of rolling plains area. And then rainforesty, deep mountainous areas. I mean, there's got to be something winged and unusual out here. And I was absolutely right. <laughs> um, I did maybe a little bit of research and came upon this article and this was from uh, mysterious universe and it's actually from last year and uh, this was written by brett tingley several north carolina residents are reporting sightings of a strange winged creature or possible multiple creatures in north carolina one of the witnesses cynthia lee of raleigh uh, says she's seen the animal multiple times it's a large flying beast that sounds like it's straight out of the Triassic period. She describes it as a long tail with a diamond-shaped bulb on it. It was dark brown. It had a weird crest. I drew a picture of it. My mother and uncle saw one, too, when they were playing outside my grandma's house when they were very young. They told grandma she didn't believe it. I thought these things were extinct. And she keeps describing it, and it's pretty much the description comes to a pterosaur. But it's a pterosaur. It's you know, something from the Triassic period. Now, there is a cryptozoologist, Jonathan Whitcomb. He says he's not alone in believing that there may be still living pterosaurs in North Carolina. My Mm. associates and I believe these are non-extinct pterosaurs. And he reported that to the Raleigh-based newspaper, The News and Observer. And he's like, what many persons would call pterodactyls or flying dinosaurs. He claims to even have a Civil War era photograph, which shows a group of soldiers posing um, with what he claims is a dead pterodactyl. Yeah, well. And. I don't know about that. Yeah, we're sitting here. The link to this article will be in the show notes, but I'm very skeptical about this this photograph. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't quite, I don't know, something's, something's off with it, you know, and they don't really have a, a large enough resolution image for you to kind of take a look at and see, mm-hmm. but, um, yeah. And then 
even though these eyewitness accounts seem very sound and very matter of fact, you know, I don't doubt the authenticity of these people saying what they saw. The local zoologists aren't convinced. When asked for a local response, the head of paleontology at the NC Museum of Natural Science replied only that pterosaurs are extinct and have been for 65 million years. Mm. See the calf. <laughs> I know, right? Mm, yeah. And then other local wildlife experts suggest these sightings are most likely yeah. great blue herons. Oh, you didn't see a dinosaur with a long tail with a diamond-shaped bulb on the end of it. What you seen was a skinny-legged, pointy-nosed bird. bird. Which? A heron. <clears throat> you know, what else? I mean, come on. <clears throat> and, and okay, I grew up by the beach, and then as a, an adult, I did spend a lot of time towards swamp and brackish areas in Virginia. So I've seen a lot of great blue herons. I've seen a lot of white herons. They don't match a pterosaur at all. Nope. And their migratory pattern and basically where they normally go wouldn't be out in Raleigh. Yeah. They, they stick to the coastal regions. And then when it comes time for them to migrate, they fly straight to New Mexico. And everybody in New Mexico, we make a big, great deal about it. We take pictures in the wintertime. That's it. Pretty much. They don't hang out in weird places. And... They're not as big as dinosaurs. So I don't buy that explanation either. So, yeah. But, again, cryptid, flying cryptid sighting in North Carolina. Yep. You know? And then the most disturbing, or it's very strange, the most strangest thing I found, uh, that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> yeah. But this, I found a 1986 encounter with for a North Carolina woman. She encountered a human-like winged creature. So not a pterosaur, not a thunderbird, not a rock, but a human-like winged creature. And this is actually from the Singular Fortor Fortean Society. They spoke to a North Carolina woman who said she was chased by a human winged light creature in 1986. Bet Dotson told investigator Tobias Whalen that she was on her way to Silverston, North Carolina to visit her sister when she encountered the bird-like entity. I was driving a VW Beetle to visit my sister in Silverston, which is off Highway 421. She said she was around 18 years, at the t 18 years old at the time, and she had stopped at a stop sign off 421 where my headlights were shining directly on a barn straight ahead. I saw this winged human-like creature running alongside the front of the barn. It was around six to seven feet tall, dark, with two arms, two legs, and huge wings. Dawson described the creature as part bird, part man, and said it appeared to be wearing combat boots. See, that's the weird part. Yeah, and she... <clears throat> now, I mean, the whole thing is kind of weird, but the, the whole combat booth part is kind of strange. It's a weird detail. And she's actually provided these very <clears throat> detailed sketches, and it's... Which are kind of creepy looking. But. They are very creepy. I mean, this thing does And look, we do have all the links to this sort of thing in our show yeah. notes, so you can click and see. It looks like a bird man. Yeah. I mean, it's... And she even drew the combat boots, but the rest of the outfit kind of almost reminds me of original Star Trek, because it's got, like, mm. the V-neck and the the fittedness to it, right? Yeah. So this creature, obviously, it... Shops at Old Navy. <laughs> no, it freaks this woman out. And she decides she's going to speed away, only to discover that the creature has given chase. I made a left turn and sped up, questioning what the heck I was seeing. I heard two wings. I heard wings flapping. I looked into my driver's side mirror, and I could see this thing almost on top of my car following me. It kept up with my speed, which I would estimate at about 45 to 50 miles on a very curvy two-lane road. Hmm. In a Volkswagen Beetle. <clears throat> yeah. I don't know. Uh, that just kind of struck me as uh, well. I mean, you can, you can do it. <laughs> yeah. You know? It's not, yeah. I mean, it's not, no, I mean, it, it's. But even on this curvy road and going as fast as she could, it was following behind her and yeah, beside her part. vehicle for several miles. Now, the wing being seemingly attacked her vehicle as she fled, during which time the car's electrical system was drained. And that's where it gets weird, because that's a phenomenon commonly reported by witnesses of UFOs and yeah, UFO abductees. battery drain. Yeah. Her VW engine was sputtering, and seemingly the battery was being drained. Headlights yep. started dimming as she rounded curves. 
This winged thing was flying over and pretty much clinging to the driver's side of the car. It was hitting her car and smacking into it. Gross. Yeah. She didn't understand. She's like, I don't understand why he was on the driver's side hitting my car. Like, I felt he was trying to get inside my vehicle. He was trying to get me. And then she actually draws what was going on and it's got like her little terrified face inside the Volkswagen and she's trying to just go, go, go. And this thing is grappling the side of the the Volkswagen, you know? (laughs) Now, here's where it gets strange. We're talking about a flying cryptid and now suddenly it starts to go into the UFO territory. Yeah. Dotson doesn't remember what happened immediately after the attack and said that she later came to still behind the wheel and driving after four hours of missing time. Hmm. That's that's pretty crazy. She, she's like, I had missing time after rounding several curves. I don't know why or what happened after those curves. I was further puzzled and lost. I saw a sign that read Camp Joy, and I had no clue how I got off my normal route. How did I get over here? She had left for her sisters around 8 p.m., but it was after midnight by the time she returned home. So, mm. that's the problem. It should have taken Lost no more. time. Yeah. The car is dying. It should have only taken her 20 minutes to go see her sister, and instead this whole experience was over four hours. Mm. Yeah. See, when we hear this, it doesn't <clears throat> really sound, it really kind of at all like a flying cryptid more so than... Like UFO or something. Yeah. Almost like. Or a UFO encounter or, or even like a, an abduction scenario that happens. But it's a very unusual abduction scenario. Yeah. I mean, usually if you hear of like a flying creature in UFOs, it's something like, like the owl phenomenon that was going on in like the late 90s where you saw like a giant white owl or a bird face, you yeah. know. Um, this is a bird man, you know. With and, combat boots. Yeah. And that's that's the crazy part about it because I mean this this has this was a continuation of other events. A few years prior to this incident, Dotson said she had seen a shadowy figure with a bird face and weird grin while sitting at home in bed reading a book. She saw mm. a shadow cross her hallway before the thing peered around the doorway into her room. She sat frozen in fear and and the creature left without further incident. Now, that incident followed one in 1981 where Dotson awoke at 2 a.m. to a bright light flooding her room. I thought the mountain was on fire. Yeah. She looked out her window and saw a sh- cigar-shaped craft emitting twin beams of light, and the sight of which left her paralyzed. Afterwards, she said she suffered from symptoms of shock and fatigue, and that her body temperature was much higher than normal for some time following this event. And for me, that is what the third Mm. time I've read about a cigar shaped craft in North Carolina. And that is the, that is very much in line with the typical abductee experience, temperature change, uh, feelings of shock and, um, the, the fatigue, like she's been through something, you know? So this is a UFO experience. That's what it sounds like. Yeah. And, and She goes on to continue and say that she has suffered multiple abduction experiences and doesn't like to talk to it, talk about it. But as far as the winged creature she saw, she believes it's related to the UFO in experiences and it involves reptilians and hybrid experiments. Gross. Yeah. Many people have asked me what I think I encountered, a demon, a mothman, and so forth. I think I encountered a half-bird, half-man experiment. Winged creatures are somewhat fallen angel draconian. Some of them are experiments. So she believes that she experienced an encounter with an alien hybrid that coincides with her UFO abductee experiences. So that's kind of a blending of two different phenomenon for me. Yeah. And it's, it's hard to digest, but it's very intense. So, because it has combat boots. <laughs> I mean, it's not just the combat. <clears throat> boots. Well, I mean, that's a big part. It was like, why? Why, yeah. if you can fly, why would you need? I, don't, I guess I don't understand. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of weird, but you know, I mean, it's it's a weird it's a weird thing. I've now read the so. story like three or four times, and the combat boots thing, as well as the bird face, 
Yeah. That, that's that, just kind of weird. Yeah. So there wouldn't be a need for combat boots. Well, if it's a hybrid, it would probably have like bird feet. Or maybe a uniform of some sort. Yeah, who knows? Yeah. <laughs> so Weird. Yeah. So me looking for flying. So that was in what, 1986? Yeah. Flying cryptids in North Carolina. Man, Not disappointed. Some flying cryptids in 2018. Yeah. And then on top of all that, the FBI decided to go ahead and release some Bigfoot files from like 1976. That's clickbait. I mean, it's totally clickbait. <clears throat> because the FBI set everybody up. They, they did a tweet where it's like they, they had the tweet said about Bigfoot and then a link. <laughs> So everybody's like, oh, my God. Yeah. Bigfoot's released. You know, Bigfoot's a real thing because the FBI has released documentation saying that they believe in Bigfoot. And they, you know, the whole, uh, there you go, with the whole disclosure thing, right? Yeah. And it was just basically a cache of files that they had with about, you know, re- related to examining 15 hairs and a little piece of skin. Yeah. That somebody had sent in from whatever. I can't remember the name of the Bigfoot uh, organization. Bigfoot Information Center and Exhibition. Yeah. Was the original group, uh, BIC or yeah, BIC. So somebody did like a Freedom of, Freedom of Information Act to get them to release what they had. And they did because you know what they found? Nothing. Yeah. Deer hair is what they say. But mm. see, that's just it though because people were like, now well, the, of course they're going to say that. The BIC originally filed this information, uh, the Freedom of Information Act, in relation to something that we've talked about previously on the podcast. And that was an Army Corps of Engineers uh, atlas that had been published yeah. where it was supposed to discuss the flora and fauna of the Pacific Northwest, but it did have a couple of tongue in cheek references to Sasquatch as well as like a, a discussion pretty much of what would happen if Sasquatch were real. Yeah. And like that's what it. To do. Yeah. And that's it. No real like, Hey, we believe in him, but Hey, if Sasquatch is real, this is how it would affect our parks and wilderness areas. You know? Yeah. It wasn't anything, you know, confirming him. But BIC took it to a different level and said, we want confirmation. You have this government document. And it's not really a government document. It's an atlas. So we want the FBI to explain this. Also, here's some hair samples. Hmm. And the FBI agreed to analyze the mysterious hair and skin samples, which turned out to be deer. That's what they say. Yeah, that's what they want you to believe. (laughs) And it's fun. They mailed back a letter with the sample and enclosed the results. Yeah. And that is the document that was in the FBI vault. That's it. Hmm. So, uh, it's clickbait, everybody. No, the FBI did not acknowledge the existence of Bigfoot. Yeah. They just release their findings. I mean, just much like if you sent anything to them and they had to examine it, yeah, you know, yeah, they had a report on it, and what they released was the results, and the results weren't conclusive to Bigfoot or anything like that. They were deer. Yes. So they didn't really admit anything. They just basically turned over the information as as it was requested. You mean they did their job? Well, yeah. I mean, it's not. <laughs> it's a little bit deeper than that because yeah, you know, they did their job. But this is on the you know whenever anything like this happens and. Like, even going back to just a couple of weeks ago, or, or probably about a month now, um, the Navy, and well, the Armed Forces, actually. I'm not, it's just not the Navy. It, well, the Navy was experiencing seeing un- unexplained flying objects, right? Yeah. Unidentifiable flying objects. You know, and, and so there was really no way to report it, so they went ahead and came up with a way to report it with a form and everything like that. And even on the form, it says, can you release it to the public? In other words, a, a way to sort of document things that were unusual, yeah. And that turned into the U.S. Navy admits there's UFOs. No. It's like, well, of course, there's unidentified flying objects, right? But there's a way to document it. That's all it was. It's an exercise in, in basically documentation so that if somebody asked for it, they'd be able to produce something to say what was seen with all the pertinent details, primarily because I think Congress was asking for more information like that. So, But it's still It being... wasn't disclosure. Yeah. And it wasn't them admitting anything. And, you know, there are UFOs. And, and if you can't, if you see something in the sky and you don't know what it is and you can't identify it, what is it? A UFO. It's an unidentifiable but flying object. But it's still being spun in the media and on social media as the U.S. Navy admits an aliens exist. Of course, because they want you to uh, click on it. They and want you to read it. They want you to jump in there and spend the time. And I, I, I mentioned this earlier, and it's still 
just my little grudge right there. Other communities besides the paranormal community have been actively over the past couple of years fighting back against clickbait and, you know, kind of false or mixed truth news. Yes. Every other community, it doesn't matter, but it could be the fashion or actual politics or whatever. Everybody has been fighting back against this. Why is the paranormal community not fighting back against this, this apparent clickbait? Hmm. And they're not. Instead, people are eating it up and resharing it. Well, I think it's because people think it's interesting. And, you know, who is it going out to? It's going out to everybody. But you have people who are literally just reading the clickbait title and immediately resharing it That's as news. That's exactly what they want. Everybody wants that. You post something, especially if you create any kind of content, and you want people to click on it. It's just that some people seem to think that, uh, you know, that they would rather believe than question it later. Yeah. <clears throat> so like, oh, there we go. But why just so. go for the headline and then state just by reading the headline, not clicking the link or reading the article thoroughly and critically thinking that the headline is the absolute there? No, because that's what nobody does these days. <sighs> so. And I feel that the paranormal and 14 communities are highly susceptible to that. And that's <clears throat> not fair. Well, so. Duh. <laughs> I mean, it is what it is. So, yeah. just you know, but the, it's the whole thing. And you know, people say, "Oh, this is just the beginnings of the you know, the beginnings of disclosure." No, and it's not. It's just clickbait ads that get put out there, articles with ads to generate revenue, and you clicked on it. We we do. You click on it. I clicked mm -hmm. on it, and guess what? You're like, "Well, oh, okay." Yeah. Nothing. But like, but people look at like, ooh, or they'll just skim the article or skim the title and think, "There you go," and that's what they live off of when it comes to. Their dealings with any kind of research. There's but, a lot of researchers out there that are internet researchers, and they'll hit the title and that's it. I'm like, okay, so no, yeah, I, well, it makes my skin <clears throat> crawl. Do your research, think critically, come up with your own opinion. Yeah, uh, the title or whatever link you're sharing, that's not the end all. That's true. Do your own research. I mean, I did my own research and found the original FBI tweet, which was quite amusing to me. Yeah. You know, that guy was probably like, you know, hearing from his boss. <laughs> it was like, yeah, could I talk to you? You just put Bigfoot and then you posted a link. Yeah. <laughs> All right, moving on. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <clears throat> so we we talked about Pope Lick Monster. Yeah. Um, and sadly, people seem to go out there and die. Yeah. Not all the time, but it does happen occasionally where... There's a railroad trestle, and if you want to go see, or if you're there looking for the Pope Lick monster, you know, you wind up on top of the trestle, the railroad trestle. Yeah. And it seems like bad stuff happens. Whenever you're on top of a railroad trestle, it's only a matter of time. Yeah. That a railroad train or a train is going to get you. Hmm. Especially if it's an active railway, which it is. And so people go out there looking for it. And you know, the thing is that you need to be up on the trestle to be able to take a good look to see if you can find it. And invariably, somebody gets hurt. And the whole area is to kind of depressed anyway, so it's not necessarily a good area. They found a body there last time. Yeah, and that's what we reported into, on. Right. And, yeah. then, and then here it is like two weeks later, I think. And guess what? They found another one. Yeah. Unfortunately, one dead, one in ICU. Yeah. Uh, two teenagers. 15-year-old. Yeah. You know, hit, killed by the train on top of this stupid trestle looking for the public monster. And then, of course, what does this do? Feeds the urban legend or feeds the legend of the, of the cryptid that's in that area, which is the public monster. Yeah, which is like a goat man, sa sheep squatch type yeah, like creature. Yeah, squat. Yeah. Yeah. So, and we, I mean, who's to say that the other article that came out a couple of weeks ago talking about the you know, the monster, the Pope Lick monster, mm -hmm. didn't feed this sort of urban legend thought into yeah. these kids' head to go out there and look for it too. Mm -hmm. And they got up on the train tracks, and the, it, you know, hey, train comes. It's a railroad trestle, so it's not like it's a bridge where you can just step to the side. They're typically only built big enough for the train to pass, and they're just inherently dangerous. And so, and train got them. Yeah. You know, one one didn't make it, and the other one's in, in, in bad condition. So, and it's like, it's, it's needless, it didn't have to happen, I think. And, you know, it, it kind of goes back to the clickbait thing, right? Yeah. So, you read the article, or you read the title, and you're like, ooh, and, you know, that sort of feeds into whatever and i'm sure these these kids had they're from the area so you know they've heard about the public monster yeah so they probably thought they'd be brave and go out there and, and try to see it right 
which, you know, a lot of times you, you do that sort of thing. They're going to go out there and, you know, prove themselves. But in this case, it, it didn't work out quite so well. So it's another misfortune, right? I don't know. And and that's the problem with this. It's an urban legend that keeps perpetuating itself. Well, yeah, because, and, you know, and what happens when somebody dies out there? Oh, the public, public monster. monster. Yeah. Yep, there you go, public monster. I mean, the original article that we talked about, it was about a body found near a haunted attraction yeah. built because of the Popelet monster. Yep. And the body was found in that area. That led us down the rabbit hole of many deaths and injuries involving the trestle. Yeah. <clears throat> and just the area in general is not necessarily very good. Yeah. And what's sad is there have been attempts to secure the trestle or change it. Yeah. And those have actually been fought or shot down. I mean, there's a tongue. Yes, they vote to do it and then yeah. they don't do it. Or they say they're going to do it and then don't do it. Like, there's a tongue in cheek yeah. article from like 2016 saying something like, uh, the plans to revitalize will not affect the ecosystem of the Popelik monster, which I found really offensive. Yeah. Because, okay, you're not going to make this train trestle more secure. You're too worried about it being an eyesore hmm. to ensure people's safety. Well, something's going to happen eventually. So, but. Yeah, and I did want to thank our friend from Chasing Night Shadows for sharing this article with yes. us. So Nathan. Yes. <laughs> so, but yeah, we found this one. And Purveyor like, fine hot dogs. Hey. <laughs> Nathan. No, but yeah, it's it's something he kicked to us um, after we did you know, our little thing. It was like I think it was like a week later. Yeah. He kicked it over our way. It's like wow, man, again. So, so. it just kind of makes you wonder, kind of what's going on with that. It's like the last time we talked about the Brown Mountain Lights. And that our beginnings to go do some more serious research into the Brown Mountain Lights. And we did a little interview at Wiseman's View, and we talked about it and kind of laid out what we're going to do. And then, boom, what, like two days later or something like that? An update. Yeah. Where it's like, oh, the Brown Mountain Lights. Captured on camera. Yeah. Which They've is, been identified. But it's weird because the this article in question that's now circulating the news talks about the Brown Mountain Lights camera from January 10th and 11th yeah. between minutes or between 0 0.52 and 0 0.01.02 seconds. So in between... It's between 52 seconds and a minute, yeah. minute and two seconds but later. we watched this yeah. in our research and we had a different conclusion. So why is this... This footage, which we saw, it was posted to YouTube in a timely manner by the person who does this research. Why is this just now hitting the news? Is it because everyone else is talking about Brown Mountain Lights? I don't know. Yeah. Just, just, I don't know. It's, it's kind of hard to say, right? Mm -hmm. Because this kind of thing, sort of ebb and flow, comes and goes. Um, but they talk about the lights, and you can see them. And then there was also... Something that was trying to say, and I can't remember what the article is, that the Brown Mountain Lights have been debunked as oh. being, uh, like, solved as being balls of plasma and all that sort of thing. And, again, no, that's not the case. Yeah. Because they can't prove it because it hasn't happened. But um, where they've been able to actually capture, you know, obtain proof, yeah. basically. Because that's the thing about these things. You see them from far away, whether it's plasma or ball lightning or some kind of bioluminescence or... You know, something related to Gas the crystals in the area, as yeah. in the, the uh, feldspar quartz and the quartz crystals and stuff. Radium. Yeah. And, you know, these lights have been around for a long, long time, like decades, decades old. And when it talks about recently capturing these lights on the video, I wasn't impressed. It's like, <laughs> and, you know, that's, that's the problem I have. Whenever you set up like a, a closed circuit television or uh, like a, you know, a system, like a security system, right? To mm -hmm. record this, kind of, they have such a slow frame rate. Yeah, like fourteen frames per second. And then, so then when a bug goes flying by, it looks like a flying rod. It undulates when it flies. It's like, no man, the frame rate is so slow. You can't. And that bug whizzing by his wings is so fast, it creates that sort of effect. But you, these lights were terrible. Yeah. Or the video uh, wasn't wasn't very good compared to what you would hope. Yeah. So. It's like, okay, so, yeah, January 10th and 11th at about 6.30, right? Mm -hmm. From 6.30 p.m. or 6.26 p.m. to 6.10 a.m., they have that, they have the video up and running, and you can just see, like, some lights kind of pop up and some stuff that goes flying by, which is probably a, a plane. 
Yeah. And the plane is leaving a streak about an inch and a half long, and every light there has a light streak on it or a light leak. Yeah. Because of the terrible frame rate. So these are dust to dawn images. If you go to this YouTube channel, which I have actually subscribed to, I subscribed yeah. to it, like, gosh, when we moved here. Yeah. But 30 second images. Yeah. On whatever type of camera system that's being used here. And it's probably 14 frames per second. That would actually be a relatively fast frame rate for a camera that's been up for a while. Yeah. Like, as in, it's a couple of years old. Like, Because if it's the same camera we're thinking of, that thing, unless it's been updated is an old camera system. It's an old DVR system. And yeah. it seems like a lot of what we see on this video occurs just slightly out of frame. Well, I'm watching the bugs passing by. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, it's old. It yeah. still has like a 640 by 480 sort of resolution to it, which is more of a square than 16 by 9. So yeah. that should kind of give you an idea how old it is. It's probably 2005 or earlier. Hmm. So, well, maybe a little bit later than that. You know, maybe 2006 or 8 or something like that, but. Um, when you can he? see the car lights going by, and then all of a sudden you see like a little spot where there's some bright lights that seem to come up um, into the camera's frame and whiz in the corner and then sort of disappear. Yeah. I was like, okay. Wish there was more. And if we had a faster frame rate on this video, there wouldn't be such a light trail. That's very true. So you'd probably just be able to see it as a ball or whatever. But other than that, it's like, nope. I know. Well. I'm I'm not sold. Nope. We're still going to go out there. We're still going to check it out. We're still going to see what it's all about. Maybe we can actually get lucky and we can see it. And we'll bring our cameras out there. They have a much faster frame rate. And hopefully we can get just as blurry images as they do. Because <laughs> that's probably what's going to happen. <laughs> because the theory that all cryptid stuff, all paranormal stuff are really just blurry. And that's why you can't see them. That makes you me take a picture. angry. Like the reason why you can't capture a good, clean, crispier image, uh, crispy image of a Bigfoot is that they're blurry. I mean, it works, right? Nope, can't get a picture of a ghost because the ghost is blurry. It's like they just blurry because they seem to exist at a different frequency. They oscillate at a different frequency, different life vibration. You mean like Superman or the Flash? Yep. They no. Can just oscillate fast enough to where your human eye can't focus and neither can the camera. So That's a cop out. Hey, it explains a lot. The right. reason why you can't take a good picture of that UFO is because it's blurry. <laughs> right? Bigfoot, blurry. Nessie, blurry. Sheep squirts, blurry. But that would mean if they're blurry and they function at a different frequency or just they're they're projected at a different way. Slightly out of phase. Out of phase. Then why not somebody who has some sort of eye problem? Why aren't they able to see them better? Well, because just because you have an eye problem doesn't mean the rate or the spectrum that you see at is better or worse necessarily than anybody else. Okay. It just means you have an eye problem. <laughs> yeah. Because your eye problem would have to match the frequency of whatever is oscillating for you to be able to see it just to begin with, let alone, you know. Well, you do. Have, there's that one eye condition where you have constant tremors in your eye. I mean, you can still look. Which makes your eye blurry. Yeah. So, so. that whatever you look at, it's going to be a little blurry. Mm-hmm. So if you look at a blurry Bigfoot, it'd be twice as blurry. <laughs> well, you don't That's know. That's not how this works. It's not like, okay, so your eyes are blurry and the Bigfoot's blurry. We'll all we'll be able to see clearly because we're both blurry. It's not how that works. Or right. how or how about we just try harder at, at taking better pictures of these these phenomena? Hey, you, know, you do what you got to do. Make sure autofocus is enabled. Make sure what you're shooting is actually focused. Instead of you're asking a lot. Instead of just saying, "Bigfoot is blurry," the brown mountain lights are blurry, UFOs are all blurry. Well, the evidence speaks and, for itself. And That's are why they, you can't see them. I mean, go, look at all the pictures; they're all blurry. Now, are they all blurry, or are they different levels of blurry? They're blurry enough. Like, is Bigfoot more blurry or less blurry than a UFO? It depends on what type of Bigfoot you're talking about <laughs> and where it is. So. Now we're just being silly. No, you're being silly. Stop <laughs> trying to split hairs. The, these things are blurry, and that's why they're captured blurry. So that's it. No. <laughs> yep. Yeah. That's all it is to it. Okay, so Bigfoot and Brown Mountain Lights and all aliens are blurry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Speaking of aliens, on June 14th and 15th in Spruce Pine, North Carolina, they're going to have the Spruce Pine Alien Conference and Expo. Yes. 
Very excited. It's on the 14th and 15th of June. Free mm-hmm. admission. So barely a week away. Yep. So you should come if you're in the area in Western North Carolina and you have uh, some free time. You should pop on out there and see some UFO type stuff. It is a UFO themed convention. It's the first one of its kind in Spruce Pine. It should be good. So it's lots of stuff to do with the kids. Yeah. You can paint their stupid faces <laughs> with something. Yeah. Like face paint. No, there's going to be. You know, they get like little designs and stuff like, yeah, make me look like a cat or make me look like a chicken. Make me look like an alien. Yeah. How about make me that? look like a big bug eyed alien. But so, I mean, there's, but there's going to be lots of good stuff to do. There's going to be a, a stage. There's going to be, uh, a, there's a, a band. There's an Area 51 playground. Bands, an Area 51 playground like that's, that's bounce house. not for you. <laughs> it's for kids. Darn it. Uh, there's a beer garden. Oh. So you can go drink beer. Mm hmm. Uh, there's going to be lots of vendors. There's going to be lots of panel talks going on. Mike Barra from Ancient Aliens is going to be there. There's all sorts of stuff yeah. going on. Now, um, if you want to go see Mike Barra talk, it's it's that's paid. Yeah. And yeah. you'll want to check the website, which we'll put the link in the show notes, yeah. to register for tickets for his event. He's doing two different talks about yeah. two different things. So you can go see him talk twice with uh, you know about different things. So it's not like the same thing repeated. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's going to be panels on... UFO type stuff, and I believe some cryptid type stuff, and probably some paranormal type stuff. It's going to be good. Yeah. So, and it's a it's a small town, Spruce Pine. So this will be a little bit helpful. And they're also going to be, you know, sort of touching on one of the reasons why Spruce Pine is is should be famous, but it's really not. They have some of the purest crystal in the world, like quartz crystal. Yeah. Uh, very very pure, and the. The crystals from spruce pine, as you're using electronic devices, uh, you probably have it in your phone or electronic device right now. Yeah. Because it's like all over the world. It's some of the purest concentration of minerals and precious metals and things like that. Um, And if you follow along with ufology, you know that many UFO talks discuss how aliens require selenite and quartz. And selenite's in the southwest, yeah. New Mexico. Selenite and gypsum and stuff like that. And yep. then quartz and some of the other minerals right here in Spruce Pine, North Carolina. Yep. So, so you should go. It's going to be, it's called Space. Mm-hmm. Spruce Pine Alien Conference and uh, Expo. Yep. We'll be there. And you can come by and talk to us and that'd be pretty cool. Come by and say hello, especially if you listen to the podcast. We might have some so. exclusive swag. Yep. Or we might not. <laughs> Never know. Kind of depends. If you're nice, you might get something. But if it's uh, you know, a thing where you're not nice, guess what you get? What? Knuckle sandwich. No, stop. <laughs> so, that's old school, right? You can yeah. just knuckle old, sandwich in everybody right. tonight. Old knuckle sandwich. <laughs> so get out there in the yard. It's, uh, it's like you know, duking it out. But no, it's going to be a fun time. It should be uh, something that if you're in the area and you, you know, would like to stop by, you should. Because it's free admission. There are events for the kids. There's contests about a uh, what was it dressing up like aliens? Like yes, alien theme contest. There's a kid level one, and then there's a grown up level yeah. one because you don't want some grown up showing up with like the the aliens, you know, movie costume all professional, and then like the little kid with his little green suit on. That's going. exactly what I would do. <laughs> Let me get a super sweet costume. Like costs James like Cameron. Bucks. Go rolling up, <laughs> little kids in a green trash bag. Like, it's like you might as well just sit down, kid. Let me show so you. How That's kind of what's going on with this whole UFO thing. People are aggravated, you know, the old researchers, and yeah, you know, they're doing their thing, and they think that the new ones don't necessarily <laughs> respect. It. That's exactly what it is. So you just called all the new schoolers like their little dinky. Concept. Well, no, it's that sort of thing, you know. You, you know, it's a little, it, I don't know. It's kind of hard to describe, but. You know, on the other side of that, though, what if you got like a kid who does cosplaying on the weekend? He dresses up like an alien. Like you'd be thoroughly impressed. Whereas, yeah, you know, somebody's dad is dressed in a green trash bag, <laughs> <laughs> right? So it lights up. <laughs> it's like standing next to a perfect cosplayer, and you get this dude in a green trash bag with glow in the dark stuff, wearing sandals with socks, a fanny pack. But he's having a great time. And his cargo pants have lots of pockets. Each of which has nothing in it. One's everything stuffed in one pocket instead of utilizing all the zipper pockets. But you know what? I bet he's or having a blast. Or if he gets hot, they can zip them pants legs right off and turn them into shorts. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm not going to hate on that. I think that's actually a really good idea. <laughs> so until you lose one of them, then you're stuck with like shorts. Mm-hmm. So there you go. 
So anyway, I think it's about time we go ahead and end this podcast. Okay. Been rambling on for quite a bit. So it's going to be very nice. Yeah. But yeah, you should check out the Spruce Pine Alien Conference um, uh, and Expo. Yeah. We'll put so, links in the show notes for this podcast June 14th episode. Yep. And 15. You should check it out. It should be good. Mm. Very, very nice. All right. So next time, we're going to talk about what? Um, weird stuff. It'll be our Weird Wednesday. We're going to talk about um, what we're going to call it. Uh, what should we call it in a way that people can understand and relate? Mo- we're just going to call it Modern American Hinges. Yeah. Like Stonehenge. Yeah. But with modern stuff. <laughs> like cars so you may or may not have heard of them or some of these so anyway that's what we're going to do now if you'd like to reach out to the podcast you can do so you can email us at contact at creepgeeks.com again uh, we usually mention it but if you want to reach out to us and share a story we respect your anonymity if you don't want your name used we'll respect that Alternately, you can always give the show a call, leave a detailed message, let us know what you're wanting to talk about or share with us. That phone number again, 575-208-4025. Alternately, you can go to creepgeeks.com, click on that contact us link. Yeah. I actually built that little button and I'm proud of it. And fill out the form and we'll get in contact with you. Join us on social media. We are pretty much everywhere. Yep. Yep, and we like interacting with folks. It's very nice. Mm-hmm. That's pretty much it. All right. Yeah. Well, very much uh, appreciate you tuning in and listening to the Great Geeks podcast. Any questions, comments, concerns, let us know. Really was. We look forward to seeing you next time. Yep. So anyway, see you later. Take it easy. Bye, sickle. Bye.